at Agape, I just feel it's not, you know, just a church where you walk in and you leave and no one notices. Um, I really feel like the people here are family and um, it's something that we're always hanging out together, we're always doing life together. So Agape is really a family-oriented church, you know. It's not a service that you just come to and, you know, get your word and then leave. So you come, you know, you meet people, you greet them, you all like get along well and you, you get in the Word of God together and then you go out and fellowship together. From the time we stepped in to the time we left, we were just overwhelmed with people. Just people fellowship, people welcoming us, people making us feel very comfortable, very much at home, very much like we were one. My favorite part about being in Agape is that um, I've never really heard the gospel the way that I've heard it here. And so it's different and it's just it's just so wonderful and it really it just really fills my soul. So I, I like this and I've not seen it anywhere else. My favorite thing about Agape is being able to serve and and help with the community and help with the church. Um, and I think just being able to, to serve and be in that spirit of service is, is the best part of being a part of the church. I think Agape is the greatest sense of family that you can get and uh, it's just a great sense of community that holds you accountable and really helps you grow in your faith and and also it's just a great group to be around and they're constantly just uh, supporting you. So at worship I play the drums and uh, so that I really enjoy that and I also uh, love being part of the band and it's a great, great time. So what I love about this church is the community and that we're all so close and always there for one another. Um, whenever someone's going through a rough time, you have like everyone there as a big community of sisters and brothers. I think that people should come and visit Agape because we have such an incredible, incredible and diverse group of people here. We have people from all over the world, all over the country, all over Texas, from different walks of life, different ages, and we all come together for one purpose, and that's to serve God and love each other. So I think it's a place that anyone can call home. Loving fellowship. Community. Family. Worship. Church. Love. Agape. Oh. Agape. 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 You will have many blessings in heaven because you are on time. Everybody else? They're going, just kidding, they're, Jesus loves everybody. Yes, even the late ones. They're just tardy. Tardy, that's a school word. I'm in like school mode. That's, let me get a tardy pass. Okay, let's stand together and just uh, greet our Heavenly Father with a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you on time, Lord, because we love you. And because we are just so eager to see you, Lord, I pray for everybody that is on their way that you would give them mercy, Lord, to, and, uh, and strength and, uh, and power, Lord, to be on time. And I pray, Lord, for this church that we would just come eager to see you and meet you and worship you, Lord, this morning. We love you. As we sing, Lord, our worship songs this morning, may our words from our, come from our hearts to glorify your name because you are worthy to be praised, Lord. Fill this place as we call upon you, Lord, this morning. So because you are good and your mercy endures forever. We love you, Lord, and we pray in your name. Everybody said, Amen. Let's sing. Scream it out from every mountain top. 
Your goodness knows no bound. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I'll see because you are good. And I'll dance because you are good. And I'll shout because you are good. You are good to me. And I'll see because you are good. And I'll dance because you are good. And I'll shout because you are good. You are good. You are good to me. Nothing, nothing and no one comes anywhere close to you. The earth and oceans deep only reflect this truth. And in my darkest night, you shine as bright as day. Your love amazes me. I see because you are good and I you are good and I shout because you are good, you are good to me. And I see because you are good and I dance because you are good and I shout because you are good, you are good. When I cry your praise, my heart will proclaim. the sun rain my life celebrates you are good you are good with a cry of praise my heart will proclaim you are good you are good in the sun rain my life celebrates Good, and I'll dance because you are good. And I'll shout because you are good. You are good to me. And I'll sing because you are good. And I'll dance because you are good. And I'll shout because you are good. You are good. You are good to me.
impossible things in your name they shall be done unstoppable god let your glory go on and on impossible things in your name they shall be done Nothing is impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll sing your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Nothing is impossible with God. You can do all things in the name of Jesus. And when my head stretched out towards the sky, you never let me run dry when i dive into the depths of you heart is made on you jesus in you sing it again when my hands stretch out towards the sky you never let me you never let me When I dive into the depths of you, heart is made on you, Jesus in you, your love. your love is a flood, and I'm caught in the current of your living waters, it's your love, it's your love. Your presence is a flood, and I'm caught in the wonder. You have taken me over, you have won my heart. Sing that again on my hands. When my hands stretch out towards the sky, you never let me run dry when i dive into the depths of you heart is made on you jesus you your love is a flood and i'm caught in the current of your living waters it's your love it's your love your presence is a flood, and I'm caught in the wonder. You have taken me over, you have won my heart. Your love is a flood, and I'm caught in the current of your living water. It's your love, it's your love. Your presence is a flood, and I'm caught in the have won my heart. Sing it together. 
into the deep. Into the deep I will go with you. Submerge my feet to my head and all of you. As your presence falls, I am drowned in your love. Immerse me, immerse me into the deep. I will go with you. Submerge my feet to my head with all of you. As your presence falls, I am drowned in your love. Immerse me into the deep, into the deep. I will go with you. So merge my feet, my head, and all of you. As your presence falls, I am drowned in your love. Immerse me. into the deep, Lord, in your word. Our hearts are open to you to listen to what you have to say for us, Lord. Speak to our hearts this morning as we are listening for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm just uh, delighted to have Walid and Joanne and Sister Amal with us this morning, and it's such a delight to be with you uh, again. I want to read a passage and, and meditate on a passage that is truly very dear and near to my heart. I've, uh, it has been a guidepost uh, passage in my life since I accepted the Lord as a, as a teenager or a late teenager. And I would like us to turn together on this passage which I, the theme is Create in me, O Lord, a clean heart. Uh, it's Psalm 51. It would be so nice if we memorize uh, this passage or parts of it, at least. There is, a internal, there is a paragraph there that uh, uh, starts with, uh, from verse 10 till, the, uh, till verse 13 that was so beautiful to memorize. Um, so I would like to start from verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Now here I would like to say that this passage was written by David, and it was written after a very distressful period, after he committed adultery and he sinned, and he has fallen uh, from the grace of God in a tremendous way. And then on top of all of this, to hide his sin, he went ahead and made a plot and committed murder, basically, through a plot to, to kill the, uh, the husband of uh, Bathsheba, who was the person he committed adultery with. Um, the incredible part of the Word of God, it, it, it does hide no secrets. Uh, if it was written by men, 
And if it was written by, uh, for example, uh, the, the Old Testament was written by the Jews, they would hide the faults and the failures of their big leaders, somebody like King David or even Abraham or, or Moses. They would hide these falters because if I'm going to write the biography of my, my grandpa uh, or my father, I'll make sure not to mention anything about their secret failures or some of their failures. But really, like we do eulogy, uh, eulogies in the, during funerals, we just speak of the great things that the person had. But the best proof that this is written by God himself, by the Holy Spirit, is the way failures are portrayed but, and the agony thereof. So after that period of turmoil, he cries out to the Lord, he cries from the heart and says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone only, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may by, be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and be uphold me by your generous Spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. What a beautiful and profound prayer to the Lord. Look, if this was written by a human being, 1,000 years, well, this is when David was existed. All these kind of essential truths that now have been unveiled and made, made known to us as believers 3,000 years later from David and 2,000 years later from Jesus will not be as consistent with our doctrine of faith. I've, read, I've written a lot of uh, prayers of, uh, of men from outside the Christian faith, outside the Bible, uh, of antiquity, thousand years, and, and they're not as relevant and real to the human experience, as well consistent with the Word of God, the way this one is. Now, brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. He starts with a cry for repentance and forgiveness. And this is where the Christian life, the gift of eternal life starts. It starts with a cry for true repentance and forgiveness when we are going to be born again. Now listen to this, because there is a something which is very true about here because it highlights the universality of sin. The universality of sin. It highlights the God who is loving and kind that starts with, oh God, according to your loving kindness, who is merciful, who is gracious. You hear all these words about the God we worship. But at the same time, that God who created man with a free will to just love on him and give him eternal life and give him his eternal inheritance, man have sinned, humanity have sinned, and you and I individually have sinned. Now, you have to realize that this is a biblical truth. None of us is without sin. In 1 John, in 1 John chapter 1, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar and we are lying. And there is no truth in us. Now, you have to understand that very, very importantly, because if you say you have no sin, I'm not that bad. I have no sin. And that's why I don't want to accept Christ. What you're doing is you're lying. 
And you have committed that sin right there. So if you say, I have no sin, you have committed that sin that minute. The sin of lying, lying to God and lying to men and lying to yourself. Now listen, what, what he's here is saying is there is universality of sin. Who all have sure, fallen short of the grace of God. For all of us have shown, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, this is one thing which is extremely important here to kind of realize that even if you have one sin, even if you have one sin that you consider a little sin, which let's say lust or just with the eyes or something like that, you consider little or you say a white, a white lie, you know, have, have you experienced a little lie that where you kind of hit something, that is enough to separate you from the Holy God. Because what it creates is it creates a barrier with God who is blameless and who is holy. And this is what's happening here. Your transgressions, it says in Isaiah 57, have formed a gap, have formed a barrier between you and the holy God. And this is, this is what happens to us when we fall in sin or we are in a sin, a sin, a sin situation, is that there is a barrier between us and the holy God who loves us. And the terrible thing about sin is it keeps you away from experiencing God who is love and the loving kindness, the love and the forgiveness of a loving God. This is what happens to sin. Now you have to understand that before David committed the sin, David was experiencing a special, as a child of God, a special relationship with God as a, as a best friend, as a dear father, and as a shepherd, remember in Psalm 23, where he tells him, the Lord is my shepherd, and this is all what I want. I'm in need of nothing. The Lord was his, not only a shepherd, but he was a father. In Psalm 27, he says, even although my ma mom and dad, my mother and father would leave me, he will embrace me. He looked at him as a, as a fatherly figure, which is exactly we understand with the New Testament when adoption happens, when you accept Christ as a personal Savior. Now you have the right to call him Abba Father. You can experience him as a father, but also as a best friend, as a companion. You can enjoy his presence, but also his providence and his eternal love. And he realized that when he committed that sin, it did separate him. Now you might... Not be somebody who has committed a sin like David. You might have, have plotted to kind of kill anybody or have, have really committed adultery, but you might be a person who have drifted away from the faith or even as a child of God or might never have experienced the Lord. And the Lord is speaking to you this morning from the heart. You are mine. You remember this? I wish we have this verse. We should translate it in English because do not be afraid, it says, because I have redeemed you. I've called your name. I've called you by name because you are mine. The Lord in a personal way is reaching out to you and says, whatever, whatever distance you have chosen from me, come unto me. I just want to embrace you. But come with the heart of repentance, if you can put the first slide, the come with the heart of repentance in order to experience my love and forgiveness. And I ask you to come to me because I care for you. Now, this is the kind of a calling that the Lord is making for every person. And that sin, no matter how little it is, it does separate you from God. Now, there's those who kind of experience the not understand the concept of grace. They have to understand that the importance and the centrality of the fact that once you commit one sin, that one sin is going to automatically lead you to death. And death means separation, a separation from God. And this could, if not associated with repentance, can keep maintain an eternal separation from a living and loving God. And this is what we call hell. Hell is being separated from the love of God on an eternal basis. And this is what the Lord is speaking to each and every one of us. Now, experience, examine, you know, just think for a minute. That person is driving, and he basically he's drunk. And then he sort of uh, hits someone and kill, kill that person, kill, kills the other person. And then they take him to court, and that person would go before court. He said, look, it was totally unintentional. I was just drunk. 
I didn't see the person. It was so cloudy and there was some rain. I did not do it. But remember, judge, remember that I have done a lot of good other works. It's an innocent mistake. I've killed that person and I should really go free because if you weigh all my good works that I've done, all the excellent things that I've done, and compare them to that little crime that I've done or little thing that I've done, and I was drunk, I should be free. Would any court in the world would do that? I mean, yes, the judge would say, we understand you've done a lot of good things, but there's a crime that you have to pay for it. And here, every one of us has to pay. The wages of sin is our death, is death. You have to pay for that sin with death, and it's eternal death. It's total separation from God and his love and his forgiveness. And this is what hell is. This is why people are tormented there, because they're sitting in a state of depression where they're eternally separated. And this is why people are separated from God. They are in that state. They're living hell on earth. But you know what? Every court in the world, no matter how tribal and how primitive it is, if the conviction has come and the verdict has come that somebody else has paid for your crime and came and turned out to be your alibi and your substitute, and if somebody else came in and said, no, 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 I did it, this person should be free then you are justified. That is, justified means just as if you did not sin, you are set free. You understand? If that court, somebody is going to come and say, I committed that, that crime, no court in the world would allow two different people be held responsible for the same crime who have never communicated with each other and have been separate from each other. And this is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. This is the grace of God. The loving God said, look, you have sinned. And the wages of sin, no matter how big or small it is, is death. You have to pay before the supreme, upper supreme court. Not in the United States. There is a supreme court higher than this supreme court. You have to pay by death. But listen, I have sent my son. My word. I came to be your alibi, your substitute. And I will take the penalty of death because I love you. You understand what it is? It's kind of a... I'm, I remember Hillary Clinton when they were asking her during the last campaign. It's interesting in the, in the campaign in the United States how they sort of pick on the, the presidential candidates. Maybe rightly so, but they go to extremes. Like they, each kind of a campaign manager is trying to show that their, their basically candidate is sinless. And then, you know, all of a sudden things start emerging and it's like, ah, you know, I wish they haven't really opened their mouth because not only they are... You know, they're really sinful. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, the campaign, they start digging graves. And Hillary Clinton, when they asked her and say, Mrs. Clinton or, you know, Secretary Clinton, uh, have you ever lied? And I was going to go hold, hold that person asking her that question. He said, what kind of question is this? I mean, who hasn't lied? But it gives you that kind of hypocrisy society lives in, even this society. And you know what she answered? She answered like a very smart lawyer. She said, I never intended to lie. Give me a break. <laughs> you just lied. What do you mean I have never intended to lie? You see, you see what it is? You see how we kind of try to make it up? I mean, if she was, I don't want to say, but if, you know, if she wanted to be candid enough, she would say, everybody has lied. But I depend on on the grace of God. I, I believe there's a forgiving God and I, I'm, I have a position and not to lie. It's something like that. But you, uh, be honest. Be honest. So there is, the, there is the universality of sin but there is the fatality of sin. Sin is going to lead to death which is separation from God. And this is why after we die physically there is an eternal separation from God. But God, the Lord, provided a provision for you. And that's why he's calling on you this morning. 
If even you have distanced yourself from the Lord or your relationship is, is not the way it is, your fellowship is not with the way it is with God. God is, the Lord is calling you this morning because of the Lord Jesus Christ, come back to me. I want to reconcile with you. I want to bring you as close as possible because I really want to bless you. I really want to experience, make you experience my eternal blessings. I want to shower my blessings and loving kindness on you. And you know, this is a true child of God because he was tormented. He knew that there was a big divide between him and the Lord. And the Lord said, I am your Savior. I paid the price. You see, in the eyes of prophecy, he was trying to, he keeps repeating these words, Lord, wash me. He felt dirty, you know. Lord, wash me, please come and wash me. I need you. Come and cleanse me. He keeps repeating this. Create in me a clean heart. Wash me with hyssop. He repeats it again. Purge me. Clean me up. Wash me thoroughly for my iniquity. Then he gets, later on he repeats it in, 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 in verse 7. He says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He felt like he had a lot of mud on him. And this is how when repentance hits home, you start calling on God and saying, God, please make me clean. But he had no way of thinking, how would the Lord do it? But thank the Lord that 1,000 years later, and through Jesus Christ, we know that he can wash us with his blood. He can make us whiter than snow. This morning, if you come before the Lord with true repentance, he will make you whiter than snow. If you haven't experienced it, he'll make you white, he'll make you clean. If there is any sin, even a small sin in your life, when you confess it before the Lord, and don't wait until Sunday till you confess it. Do the spiritual breathing. The minute you feel that you have done anything wrong, come and confess your sin. And in your daily devotion, the first thing you do, when you say, Oh Father, Oh Abba Father, hallowed be thy name. The minute I say these words before the Lord in my daily devotion, say, Lord, Make my life holy and make me clean so that I can pray your kingdom come, your will be done. So I ask you this morning that you turn your eyes to the Lord and seek that kind of forgiveness through repentance. And many people today are trying to seek forgiveness and the new life without repentance. And it doesn't work. This is a necessary element of coming to faith and reconciliation with the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance means that you're going to turn, turn direction 180 degrees to come to the Lord. You want to come and turn. You're going this way, and then you're going to turn all around, make a U-turn to come to Him and know Him. He has provided a provision, brother. He has provided a provision. I tell you this, it's one of the kind of terrible things when I watch <clears throat> around September, around September 11, this kind of a movies that will give me so many illustrations to the plight of humanity on September 11 on the World Trade Center. And what breaks my heart is when they show again these pictures that I've seen them in 2001 and I've been seeing them, of these men throwing themselves from that building on fire because they didn't want to be burned. And this is the situation of humanity. They think they're going to save themselves. And you know, some of the pictures, when I see them, I feel I want to cry. Because there are few men. There is one man who took off his jacket or possibly got a curtain someplace, and he thought he can make a parachute out of it. And he held it in such a way he thought, and when he threw himself, because he says, I'm going to be burned anyhow, so let me try this. And he held it in such a way, he felt that the air would sort of cause it to become like a parachute. And that person was thrown because it was man-made parachute and it went, he went down and hit himself and died like everybody else. I can see him with a jacket on. He kind of moves out. He doesn't know what to do, so he holds his jacket up. He holds it like this from the two sides. And try to make a parachute out of it. It's man-made parachute that doesn't work. And he dies. And many people like us, in the midst of depression and conviction, they think they can save themselves. 
But look, the Lord provided you a parachute. The Lord provided you a parachute through Christ Jesus. Those men in United 93, which was the last plane that really hit in Pennsylvania, when they realized on the phone that they are definitely dead and that these kidnappers are not there taking them, kidnapping them just to trade with them, that they have really are taking them to kind of basically blow them up either at the White House or in Congress. And they felt so desperate. Imagine if they had a parachute or they had a group of parachutes. Somebody gave them parachutes. But you know what would be the greater sin? If these men in the World Trade Center or these people in United 93, they had parachutes, somebody gave them a parachute, say, this is the way you can save yourself. And they refused. This is exactly what the Lord has given us to the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace. He said, look, this world is on fire and you have a parachute. Hold on to it. And if you say no, then you are going to be blamed for your sin. The Lord is not blaming you for the tendency to sin, but he's blaming you for the fact that you refuse to take that parachute, that way of salvation that provision of salvation through Jesus Christ. But the second thing that you see there is with repentance and forgiveness, then he cries for the roots of the, root of the problem, heart holiness. Create in me, O God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast, upright spirit within me. Look, the verse that comes before it is very profound. It says, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me what is he talking about like a tremendous diagnosis the spirit of god gave him a tremendous heart diagnosis he said lord you understand there is a tendency within me within my heart to sin there is a tendency now listen you're not held responsible for that tendency because this is a mutation. This is something that has happened when Adam fell and we sort of inherited. But you're responsible, you're responsible, you're held responsible for the fact that you don't want the Lord to do spiritual heart surgery on you to get you rid of that, the power of that tendency. You understand? To clean you and get you rid of that tendency. It's like those people who are born, Dr. Walid will understand, Dr. Jane, who's a physician and the other physicians with us, you know, I can see some of them here. They understand very well that you, some people are born with congenital heart disease. They have a tendency to have a problem with their heart. And if this heart gets infected, then they're in real trouble. If they have infective endocarditis, infection of the heart with a Mulford valve, they are in big trouble. Now, they're not held, you're not held for that tendency, for that congenital thing, that hereditary thing, unless you refuse that the surgeon would do free of charge surgery. Bono, sort of a, char a surgery for you to relieve you from that problem. Painless, free of charge. You won't feel anything, but he'll get you rid of that problem. Create in me, O Lord, O God, a clean heart and an upright spirit placed within me. This is the cry of humanity. You see, after experience the Lord, I would call on you. This is what the meaning of true being filled with the Holy Spirit is desiring heart holiness. Lord, I have a tendency with me, within me. I have that insufficiency. I have that malformation, but Lord, you can work something in it. There is something about the, I don't want to talk to you here, uh, physiology and, and medicine, but I tell you there's something incredible about what the scriptures talk spiritually would happen and what actually biologically happens to us. Every minute, the heart is being cleansed from toxic substances, including carbon dioxide and lactate and others, by the flow of pure blood coming from the lung. 
clean blood comes in every minute through the coronary arteries and goes into the heart and cleans it. It takes these bad substances, toxic substances away and it gives it oxygen and glucose, the substances of life. This is exactly what the blood of Jesus Christ would do in your heart. And you know what happens when you have a heart attack? A clot comes in and prevents this kind of a clean blood, pure blood, to purify your heart. Because a clot came into that, you know, that artery. Isn't that? Coronary artery disease, we call it. And what they do with angioplasty, they put in to remove that clot. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ does when he cleans your heart. The clot of sin, he takes it out and brings his blood to wash in. The blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all unrighteousness will give you purity of heart. And this is a prayer that you pray every day. When you confess your sin, come to the Lord and say, Lord, please keep my heart clean. If there is a wrong attitude, if there is anything wrong with it, if there is double-mindedness, if there is a, anything within me that would sort of push you away, Lord, crucify it, remove that clot, and clean my heart. Clean my heart, purify my heart. The scriptures would mention this, blessed, the Lord Jesus Christ says, blessed and the pure in heart, for they will see God. You see the consistency of scripture. You cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't see God and be in the presence of God and have fellowship with him without having a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Look, it says the same thing here in, the, in this kind of place. Create in me, O God, a clean heart, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And it says, do not cast me away from your presence. You cannot be in the presence of the living God without having a clean heart. You cannot be in the presence of a living God without a clean and pure heart. It says in Mark 7, 21, from it is within, out of the person's heart, evil thoughts come out, sexual immorality, theft, murder, lust. You know, it says from the heart all of these things come out. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? James it says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, which is forgiveness and repentance. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. You double-minded. The third thing is intimacy and joyfulness. After you experience repentance and true forgiveness and heart holiness by the blood of Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, there he tells you here, make me hear joy and gladness. After he says, create in me a clean heart and renew a spirit within me, he says, do not cast me away from your presence. This is the intimacy. And then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. There is no joy in life without purity of heart and purity of life. And being in the presence of God. It gives you this kind of a, that sets you in to be able to go into the presence of God. And you know, it says, do not hide your face from me. That is, I, I want to be in close relationship with you. I've been separated by sin from you. But now after you clean me, now I can be in your presence, in your holy presence. There is something about the holy presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I was telling my wife, Lamia, and maybe she might not like it, but, you know, we've been married for 34 years. And when, on Saturdays, when it happens that we're sitting in the same house, she's sitting at her desk and working on her laptop, and I'm sitting at work and maybe working on a sermon or a paper. And I tell Lamia, you know what? Just because I'm in your presence, it's such a, such a blessed thing. I get great satisfaction just be with you. You know, been married for 34 years. Just being together in the same room, it gives me so joy that every now and then I throw a joke, I go into a room, 
you know, throw a joke and we have a laughter together. But how much more the presence of the loving, living God? You don't know what you're missing if you're missing that good time of daily devotions and fellowship with Him. When He talks to you through scriptures and you feel like it hits your heart. And you talk to Him and you're just kind of on the way you're driving. Don't overdo it when you're driving, but, but just talk to Him sometimes. I mean, I drive well, relatively well, but I talk to the Lord all the time. And sometimes when I'm hearing a song, I'm raising my hands and people around me are saying, just stopping on the side. But, so I decided not to raise my hands. But, but, but you know what? Be in the presence of the Lord. Because He's omnipresent. He's always present. There is nothing that gives you more joy. You know, I was talking to my dear brother, Adel Taufi. He had such a terrible tumor. He had a life of really... And told you, Adel, he's my next door neighbor. And I love him. And I, I he said, Adel, what made you go through this kind of sinus cancer with all the kind of terrible radiation and chemotherapy that gave you? He says, the presence of a loving and living Lord. You know, when he used to go to... to uh, this is what gives joy to the life. When he used to go to... Uh, M.D. Anderson, and he used to put the happiest cancer patient on the front and on the back because Jesus is my shepherd and best friend. And I used to say, oh, you know, there you gave the best sermon to thousands of people. Sometimes he was trying to pay in the park and to go out, and all of a sudden, because he has heavy tearing, which is because of all the radiation he had, and somebody came to him, young man who was kind of bald and yet had, had been under radiation. And he came to him and he said, he said, uh, sir, don't cry. It's going to get better. And then he started crying, that little kid. He said, no, I'm not crying. But I can pray for you. I'm actually rejoicing because I'm in the presence of a living God who loves me. You don't know what we're missing when we have that. But last thing he says, and this is a verse I would like you to memorize and just capture. He says, when you do this, when you restore the joy of my salvation, and you uphold me with your generous spirit, you fill me with your generous spirit. You know what happens? Verse 13. Remember, this is the last verse in this sermon, and then you can go. But I tell you, verse 13 is so wonderful. And I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. You understand? وَعَلِّمِ الْأَثَمَ طَرُقَكِ you know what? This is not Old Testament mentality. This is Christ speaking through him. Because according to the religious mind, and this is what we see in our area, the transgressors, you should go kill them, David. You should destroy them. And the sinners, you should go after them. No, 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 no. He says, I will go and teach them your ways. And sinners, you know what? They would be the magnet in me of your loving Holy Spirit to draw them to you. Isn't this the story of men and women who loved the Lord Jesus Christ who came to our area? When I think of them one by one, Lillian Trasher, and I think of Eileen Coleman, how through the love of God they won people to him, children and old people and young people, people afflicted with tuberculosis, I think of Lillian Treasure and these. I think of Watchman Nee in China. Oh, I wish she, you know, people would, would kind of read a little bit about the story of Watchman Nee, that great man who spent 20 years in prison and he died in prison between 1954 and 1974. If you can read his books, he won so many people in jail because the love of God was in him and he taught behind bars. And you know, his jailers used to kind of, they stopped sending him jailers close to him because when he speaks to them, they convert, they come to know the Lord. One of his jailers used to kind of, one of the guards, one day they kind of allowed men to go in and they beat on Watchman Nee so hard with chains and, and basically bats and, with, and, and so they beat on him and they broke his shoulder and he was like, like helpless. And that jailer, he looks at him and says, Mr. Ni, nee, are you still alive? He said, yes. He said, I thought you died. And then he said, and then Mr. Ni nee said, no, I didn't die yet because I'm still praying for, your, for you to know Christ. 
Mr. Ni is telling that jailer, you know, the kind of the guard. He says, oh, please don't do that because my wife tells me that if you keep praying for me and I accept Christ, I'll be with you in that cell. He said, oh, this would be the joy of heaven. Come and be and we're both free in that cell. I'm still praying for you. You know that what happened to that guard like many other guards. He came to know Christ. And they put him in prison and he won't give up on the Lord. See that beautiful verse. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Sinners shall be converted to you. When you have the magnet of Christ, when you've experienced that gift, that blessing of a clean and pure heart, when you have been really, have experienced his loving kindness and forgiveness, when you come to his presence and experience the exceeding joy of being filled with his spirit, then you have the magnet of Christ to draw men, not to you, but to him. Let us bow our heads and pray before the Lord. Reach out to the Lord wherever you are today. There is a Lord who loves you and died for you on the cross. Tell him these words. Wash me thoroughly, O Lord, and make me whiter than snow. This morning I reach out to you and have mercy on me. And according to your loving kindness, Lord, cleanse me from any sin. And I pray in your precious name, O Lord, wash me. And I will be whiter than snow, but also create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Amen.